we have got the uh, yeah uh, today's topic is mao inhibitors we have a very learned speaker we had to specially redesign the slides for him because all his degrees were not fitting into one slide uh, i'm handing over the session to professor dr tofan pati sir sir is from katak uh, he is leading this program all the way sir over to you thank you dr lin thank you very much uh, because we are already set up time i don't think i should uh, waste time and eventually it is we have got uh, as moderator dr amrit pat joshi who is absent now but may come uh, he is professor of psychiatry and dr lim siddiqui professor of psychiatry in that now and treasurer of ips at present next slide please and our chair persons my dear 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 old friend and guide and philosopher dr bihang n vaya from mumbai international distinguished fellow american psychiatric association professor emeritus of psychiatry dr r n cooper medical center university sbt medical college mumbai founder of hod department of psychological medicine and r n cooper hospital mumbai former professor of psychiatry cooper hospital and sex yes medical college mumbai consultant psychiatrist bridge kenny and lavati hospital member national advisory board indian association of private psychiatry former international member membership committee american psychiatric association life fellow of indian psychiatric society life fellow of the association of private psychiatry former chairman psychopharmacology section of ips former chairman cmi committee of indian psychiatric society former chairman of cmi committee of indian association of private psychiatry member positive psychiatry section of all psychiatric association founder managing trustee and ceo dr nish bhaiya foundation mumbai past secretary indian psychiatric society several publications in index medical journals and chapters in textbooks and monograms welcome dr bhaiya thank you sir next slide please dr malay dawe is consultant psychiatrist in private practice and he has pg teacher experience of 11 years he has got lot of awards and honors to name a few bombay psychiatric society silver jubilee prize and ansips bhuneswar january 99 and this time it is again in bhubneswar and dr reel kisha best paper award to train ships mr bars mumbai october 1998 publications 12 position held honorary president bombay psychiatric society and member ips course and certification sub committee area of interest interest neuro neuroscience and genetics we know that the share of that welcome dr malay thank you Next sir slide. With this, I hand over the meeting to the chairperson, Dr. Dave and Dr. Dhiram Bhaiya. Please carry on. And Shyamana to introduce the speaker. And Shyamana to introduce the topic. And rest is to you. I am muting myself. Uh, Malay, what would you prefer? Uh, Let me introduce Dr. Ashok. Yes, sir. Prasad. Go ahead, please. To introduce Dr. Ashok Prasad before this enlightened audience. i feel very incompetent to actually do so introducing dr ashok prasad is like showing candle to the sun he is a man who stood up for his beliefs and studied psychiatry intensely he has got multiple national and international qualifications under his name long long ago i used to tell my students that weaker the speaker longer the introduction and dr tofan pati made a long introduction for me i won't repeat it dr ashok prasad is at this point in time he has done philosophy of medicine he has got medical physics he has done criminology you name it and he has qualified at this point in time he is heading the aims and he is making a, a, a big dent in the knowledge of psychopharmacology the stream today is to opt for ssris and the newer antidepressants or physical therapies he believed in mao inhibitors and he's proved it that it works and he is going to tell us about what is the present future and of course with reference to the past of mao inhibitors in indian practice dr ashok prasad 
Many thanks for that very, very generous introduction. Well, I feel very humbled. I personally feel very humbled by that introduction. And I hope that I don't disappoint you with my presentation over here. I thought it might be better to have a seminar format. So that is why I had spoken to Dr. Aleem, to whom I must express my most sincere gratitude to Dr. Aleem, Dr. Dr. Aleem and Dr. Pati for inviting me. I must thank the sponsors over here as well. My interest in uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors go back, because well, it just goes back about 55 years or more than that, really. That was the time when monoamine oxidase inhibitors were relatively new. Donald Klein, well, at first, uh, let me give you a little bit of history there. Amine oxidases were first published way back, I mean, it might surprise a few people, way back in 1928. Bernheim published a very interesting paper, which I've gone through in some detail. He used to be in Staten Island, New York, over there. So what she used to do is perhaps, I mean, she felt that, that there was an enzyme over there in the mitochondrial region that was used, that was absolutely essential for metabolization of neurotransmitters. Not many neurotransmitters were known at that time. And she called this enzyme, curiously enough at that time, taramine oxidase. Later on, the nomenclature was changed. And they eventually, I mean, it, like most of the psychopharmacological discoveries, even this one was serendipitous. In Staten Island, well, uh, I'm old enough to remember the first and second line antitubular drugs. And one of them happened to be Ipronyazid when we were medical students. We don't find that over here any longer. But while uh, observing Ipronyazid, she found, uh, sorry, it, it, it was uh, Grimspoon, Dr. Grimspoon, who found that while it was not so good for tuberculosis patients, who were very, very depressed, their depression was uh, significantly dented. But that led to further studies. And eventually, then the, mono, the neurotransmitter hypothesis took over psychopharmacology for a while. Malcolm later was a pioneer in that regard. But the person to whom most credit goes for introducing monoamine oxidase inhibitors were Don Klein, who eventually became my colleague at Columbia University in New York City. He was the first person to publish the paper. Well, there were plenty of papers in between, single, single case studies, which were not followed through. It was Don Klein who did that. And he found in a first double blind trial that they were as good, well, that they were certainly better than the placebos, and he, in certain depression, depressed patients, he found them better than tricyclics, which by that time had been introduced. Again, I might add that the amitriptyline and imipramine were also discovered by accident. It was serendipitous. I mean, the people didn't really know what they were looking at, but certainly they had an open mind, so they were able to identify. The same thing happened to monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Okay, it became very popular. If you look at the American Journal of Psychiatry from 1959 to 1968, you'll find practically one third of the journal every month used to be concerning monoamine oxidase inhibitors and people became pretty enthusiastic about it until Roy Kinnear published a paper it wasn't even a paper. I shouldn't say it was a paper, in fact. It was actually a letter. He published a letter in which he indicated that people who were on monoamine oxidase inhibitors reacted very badly to certain foods, most notably cheese. And that immediately pressed a panic button. When I looked at the paper, at that particular letter, he had described his experiences with just two patients. 
But the, it was enough to set the alarm bells ringing. People became very, very wary about using monoamine oxidase inhibitors. There were some who didn't feel that the evidence warranted people to be that, well, to exercise that much of caution, by caution, of course, yeah, but excessive caution to become hypersensitive. Prominent among those in Britain was a gentleman called William Sargent, who was very active in private psychiatry at that time. In fact, I remember speaking to Sergeant by that time, he was pretty old. And he mentioned that 90% of his patients were on monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And he always maintained that they showed excellent results. Now, I personally, in my, through my own experiences, wouldn't go along with that. 90% is too high a figure, plus Sergeant didn't really publish much. It was left to people like Peter Tyra, with whom I collaborated on a number of projects later on, to resuscitate the, the dwindling interest in monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And he found, well, when you look at that, personally, I mean, I would like to pose an interrogatory to people over here. The younger lot probably wouldn't have used the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. But for those of the senior generation, how many of you have actually seen a cheese reaction? I personally haven't seen a cheese reaction, and I've used monoamine oxidase inhibitors extensively. Around that time, I, well, I decided to work on a doctorate under Martin Sarler, who was regarded as the father of monoamine oxidase revolution in Britain. And we found that with proper, I mean, if you look at the side effect profile of the monoamine oxidase and inhibitors, they are no worse than amitriptyline or imipramine. It's just that there, there was so much of panic that was floating around, the people were not really prepared to give them a fair chance. I personally found that very, very unfair because the patients were benefiting. And if you can't find them, but the psychiatry is not at that stage of development that we have plenty of options. We have excessive options. We have superfluous options. We don't really have that many options. We have to take that into account that way. My guru, Professor Max Hamilton, always used to maintain that, that we don't, we don't really, we don't have the luxury of that many options. So we have to be very, very eclectic. Now, when you say eclectic, eclectic means that you're not hindered by any, any, uh, any unreasonable prejudices against a particular form of therapy without examining it in total. This hasn't been examined. When I completed my doctorate over there, I went to China, in fact, as a member of the Royal College delegation in 1985. Over there, I delivered a lecture on monoamine oxidase inhibitors and I produced a list. Now, funny enough, when I produced a list of the food stuff that people needed to avoid, China, hardly anybody ever goes and finds any cheese uh, at, the, at the stuff that we are generally were instructed to avoid while taking the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So we had to work on that. And with Professor Charney Chen of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, I did publish a paper on the tyramine rich stuff in the Chinese, on the Chinese menu, soya bean, tofu, and other things. And the same should apply within the Indian context. Well, I have the that disadvantage that I have spent practically all my professional career abroad is only after, post -re uh, after retirement that I relocated back to India, but the, even here, cheese is not that commonly used. But at the, then again, there are certain stuffs over here like achars, pickles and other things. When you use that, that contains a very high amount of tyramine. Then again, it was discovered 
that the cheese reaction was described in people who were very, very affluent. And when you looked at their food stuff, one of the staples on their menu was probably the costliest food in the world, KVR. KVR contains a very high amount of tarabine. So that is why, I mean, that is probably why monoamine oxidase inhibitors receive such a bad press. And they were virtually eliminated. Now, we are not at that stage, perhaps. I mean, when I was a resident, we would talk about, we generally used to talk about serotonergic depression, adrenergic depression. I don't think we have that competence to perhaps identify a serotonergic or adrenergic depression. That is not justified when you look at the phenomenological analysis over there. It's just not, it just doesn't work out that way. But having said that, in our own practices, we have discovered that at least 15%, well, now that the SSR, SSRIs have taken over, in my days, the SSRIs were in a state of infancy. When I started my career as a professor, SSRIs were just about being introduced. But the, when you look at that, I mean, it, not all depression could be identified as serotonergic. If you look at the axis, Stuart Checkley published a very interesting paper on that, which I think should be made available to all the residents on how to identify serotonergic depression from an adrenergic depression. We can't do that. We can't really do that. That was a myth that propagated for a long time. So if we are dealing with mean, 15% of our patients turn out, well, 15% is probably some people might regard that as too high a figure. But in my own practice, I would say at least about 10% of patients do present with resistant depression and since we don't have an option, monoamine oxidase inhibitors have been approved. Four monoamine oxidase inhibitors have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. Isocarboxazid, phenylzine, tranylcypramine, and selaginine. Selaginine is used as dermal patches. You generally tend to use that as dermal patches. I confess that I haven't had any experience with isocarboxazid, so I can't comment on that. But I have used a hydrazine monoamine oxidase inhibitor, that is phenylzine, and I have used tranylcypramine. The problem with tranylcypramine, again, I might add, was that the cheese reactions were virtually unknown in my experience. But tranylcypramine, one of the metabolites resembled amphetamine. So tranylcypramine had a market value. Laura Gillis published a paper, Laura Gillis and Robert Hemphill published a paper from Cape Town that it had a street value. Now that is not generally known, that it had a street value. It was a, because of the addiction, it certainly had a street value at that time. But uh, I mean, it's just that, I mean, if you look at the history of psychiatry, we tend to be very, very, very about the reports. There haven't been that many reports of cheese reaction anywhere. There haven't been that many reports of serotonergic reaction. And in my days, for, well, one of the commonest treatments for resistant depression was monoamine oxidase inhibitors with L-tryptophan. You tried patients on monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Nardal was my favorite at that time. If that didn't work, temporarily, we used to add L-tryptophan at that time. I personally didn't come across any serotonergic reaction. So it's really unfortunate. I mean, if you look at the younger lot today, they haven't had any experience of monoamine oxidase inhibitors at all. No experience of monoamine oxidase inhibitors at all, put it that way. And that way, they are being handicapped. We have to perhaps reanalyze 
what monoamine oxidase inhibitors can do and how useful they can be. But having said that, I might add, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, Ranga Ramakrishna has published a, a classic paper, which everybody should read really. He has indicated that the it's retarded depression, it doesn't work as well as it should, but there, for atypical depression, it should be the treatment of choice. And most of our patients, in fact, not most of us, many of our patients do present with atypical depression. There has been some revival of interest because when you look at the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, there are some reversal monoamine, re reversible monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and there are some irreversible monoamine oxidase inhibitors. We are dealing, the ones that I have described, isocortoxacid, phenylzine, tranylcipromine, and selaginine, they are irreversible monoamine oxidase inhibitors. But one has to be relatively wary about that. But 10 years ago, our own very team published a paper on reversible monoamine oxidase inhibitors that is very much available in India, that is very much available in different parts of the world, but it's being underused. Not just for depression, I found it very useful for migraine as well, and cluster headache. I'm talking about the moclegomide. It's really much available, but it's not as readily being used. I mean, certainly it deserves a trial, but we could do with a trial over here. We certainly could do with a trial in India. We haven't actually tried that so far, but it certainly merits that. We don't really know that much about pharmacokinetics, so that is another area for research. Mocledamide, of course, I mean, it has certain side effects, but uh, by no means has anybody ever reported a cheese reaction with mocledamide so far. And interestingly enough, a month ago, for an MD examination, I was examining in Gothenburg, examiner over there is known as the challenger, and the candidate is known as the defender. So I was the challenger for a candidate over there on the role of mocledamide in resistant depression. And certainly, he presented up a date with a very, very good trial. Present came up with some very interesting findings. So if you look at the retarded depression, I wouldn't really recommend monoamine oxidase inhibitors as the treatment of my first choice. But in, in atypical depression, they certainly do have a role. And we shouldn't really ignore them. That's another weapon in our armamentarium which we should be willing to use. Okay, put it to trial, put it to scrutiny, put it to up for scrutiny, that is okay but don't discard it as such. From a genetic point of view, I believe that uh, Dr. Davi is interested in genetics. Uh, well, that is an area of my particular interest as well. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors are found on the short arm of the X chromosomes. So that is another area, but there's a team working in London, in fact, I think, uh, Vaughan Ruckley is the man who's working on that. To look into the genetic aspect of endogenous depression, because uh, when you look at the genetics from uh, the genome side of it, monoamide oxidase gene is on the shorter arm of the X chromosome. And when you look at the chromosome, well, uh, mitochondria is on the inner membrane. Now the inner membrane, Anybody who has had an interest in genetics, what is present on the inner membrane usually takes longer to act. But once it starts, builds up a momentum, it acts really fast. And interestingly enough, if you look at phenylzine, that is the one that I have used the most. Phenylzine takes a little bit longer 
than the tricyclists. It takes about four weeks. Tricyclists takes about two, well, they generally take about two to three weeks, and SSRIs take about two to three weeks to act. Penalty takes a little bit longer. But once it starts acting, it usually provides us with some very, very interesting and uncaring results. Well, perhaps, I mean, I've given you the background. I certainly, I mean, when I've spoken to Dr. Aleem, we had discussed that probably a seminar format would be best, a question and answer session would be best. So that is something, uh, I might add another thing, that is another question that has come my way. We don't have enough data to be confident about prescribing monoamine oxidase inhibitors, even the, even the latest one, moclebdamide in people under 18. So I wouldn't really recommend that at this stage. We don't really have any data, any reliable data so far. But on the other hand, it should be given a try. We owe it to our patients to perhaps use everything that is within our armamentarium to see that they get better. And I'd be interested in your feedback now. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, wonderful background that you have laid. So we'll invite questions in the chat box. Uh, those who want to comment can raise their hand or put their question in the chat box. Uh, May sir, I request Dr. Malai Dave to uh, respond to some of the points that uh, have been made so far? Yeah, uh, that was an interesting uh, presentation, uh, sir. So. I think amongst uh, all of us here and uh, uh, even more than uh, what our collective experience is, uh, I'm just going through the chat box regarding the use of uh, Mao inhibitors. Uh, uh, you do have uh, uh, a lot of patient experience as well as uh, experience in clinical trials regarding uh, Mao inhibitors. We have, uh, in India, we have had uh, uh, I am of the generation which missed out on uh, uh, the traditional Mao inhibitors, though one of the traditional uh, not irreversible Mao inhibitors is now available. I think that is tranylcypromine. Uh, it's just been in the market for, I think, close to a year, year and a half now. Uh, and uh, about, uh, I would say about a decade back, uh, Remarex or Moclobomide was introduced. And uh, again, even though it is a reversible one, uh, there was still the scare about... Uh, I mean, of course, it's it's it was an irrational scare, and it is an irrational scare about the cheese reaction and things like that. But uh, when Remarex was available, uh, now even if I prescribe, I don't think it's easily available. Somehow it has kind of uh, uh, only one company made it, and it's not uh, available. Uh, but yes, the uh, the potency uh, was a question. The clinical effect that came with uh, Remarex was uh, was not uh, not really good, even though the tolerability was not that much of an issue at all. Um, the uh, as, as sir, you mentioned that it's very difficult to judge, right, uh, from when we are talking to the patient that what seems to be the basic uh, neurotransmitter uh, def deficit, defect, or problem in a patient. I mean, for us, it is the presenting complaints and we need to figure out what best suits for our patients clinically. And, and even if we look at uh, all the uh, uh, all the uh, uh, genetics or the genomic studies or genome-wide association studies that are available to us, uh, it, it's it's not one thing. It's it's a whole uh, it's, it's, it's a whole orchestra or the whole symphony of multiple small changes, multiple small mutations and things like that. And on top of it, there is always the epigenesis that plays an important role, uh, which makes it very difficult to kind of pinpoint to one effect of a gene or something. Uh, thirdly, we also now have um, <clears throat> some pharmacogenetic testing available. And, uh, but that only kind of covers up a small area of uh, drug pharmacokinetics, MVDP4550 system. So that again, leaves a lot to be desired. Now, in this, uh, uh, when we have something more to offer, uh, one thing that uh, uh, I would slightly differ from what Sir has said is that, in fact, the number of patients who do not respond very well to one molecule, two molecules, or three molecules even is pretty high. So the, the number of patients who are 
actually resistant to any kind of treatment or a combination of treatment this is significantly high and subsequent addition of molecules do not bring about much of a change in their uh, phenotypic presentations or even the process probably that is going on inside the brain which has led to these changes so something like this an older molecule which uh, another molecule uh, uh, just just uh, uh, you know parallel uh, to what you have said is clozapine now among the antipsychotic study, it is one molecule which is intensely feared uh, regarding uh, side effects, regarding uh, especially the effect on the leukocytes. But again, it has proven to be a very safe molecule. And I am sure that most of us haven't seen a single patient of agranulocytosis. So something similar is there with this molecule also. Uh, so yes, when we, when we are dealing with a whole lo load of patients, when we have... Uh, to put it very practically, limited results with whatever medications are available with us. Uh, a significant number of patients turn out to be resistant or a mixture of things which the drugs do not, the current uh, availability of drugs do not kind of uh, address. It is very nice to revisit something uh, which at least I have missed out uh, when I was uh, training. Uh, I have had a couple of patients whom I have put on uh, tranylcypromine, but uh, sometimes uh, patients do not get it very easily and they do not follow up very well. So my experience with uh, tranylcypromine at the moment is pretty much uh, very limited. But uh, yes, uh, I am in complete agreement that we need to revisit, we need to re-understand the clinical effects of uh, MAVO inhibitors. We do not have phenylzine here. So uh, maybe, sir, if you use the tranylcypromine available here, you would uh, give us still more information on that. Um, and we also need to look at the drug available now with um, whatever newer tools are available in the sense, uh, uh, because now we know that, I mean, uh, th there was just this recent paper in which created a lot of controversy amongst our fraternity here in India, as well as abroad is that, I, I mean, that serotonergic theory is nothing but just a kind of, a, in quotes, say hoax. And it, it, it's, it's not, I mean, the thing that we need to look at. We have looked at neurotransmitters uh, over the years since uh, serendipity, as you would put it, sir. Uh, but uh, probably that only seems to be the starting target of the molecules that we use, whether it's depression or any psychiatric disorder. And probably a lot of things that happen from the surface of the cell, the cell membrane, the receptor to right up to the uh, chromosome and genetic levels, which we do not know. So when we have molecules like this, which have been in the market and there's a resurgent interest, it's it's not only that we have clinical trials, but we also have uh, uh, studies on these molecules right from animal models, which probably we'll understand, by which probably we'll understand the basic pathogenesis of disorders. Uh, we would probably also understand the epigenetic effects. Uh, also, how the drugs are now metabolized, what are the components to that? And uh, probably we'll be able to tailor uh, it better. So yes, um, atypical depressions, uh, depressions that happen, or at least the the mood fluctuations that happen in, in the setting of, let's say, a cluster B personality like borderline PD, where there is always this some some or the other dysphoria going on and it's, it's difficult to put a finger on it, whether it is depression or something else which is mixed with that. So it does offer us a lot of hope and uh, uh, sir, we would continue to uh, learn more from you on this. And uh, some people have already started on you, sir. Why has everyone only put up his experiences? So, sir, back to you. Hi, well, certainly, well, I would like to add an observation over here. Well, which certainly dates back to my time as a resident. When I was training under Bob Kendall, a paper, emerged from Cohen and Cohen in Detroit, indicating that use of lithium, use of a haloperidol with lithium could lead to brain damage. That immediately people started pressing the panic button. The, the first time I examined a candidate in Aarhus, Denmark, I spoke to Morgan Sakawu, and then we looked at the paper, three patients, but it was a letter 
that related to just three patients over there. And haloperidol was used in doses of about 80 milligrams or in excess of that, along with lithium. So you can't, I mean, you can't, mm -hmm. but then again, uh, it certainly was that the interest was resuscitated, but lithium was in a very real risk of being withdrawn from the market at that time. It, it was certainly Morgan Scouse and Alec Coppins industry that saved lithium at that time. I happen to remember that. Yes, they, they had a very good uh, uh, review article. I think it was in AJP, if I'm not mistaken, American Journal of Psychiatry, which was a complete, uh, you know, over the years, over the decades, uh, what actually happens with lithium in the body? What is the change in uh, the renal function and renal parameters over time? Which was nothing really significant to raise alarm bells. So it, it has proven to be pretty safe. And again, now there is a resurgent interest in lithium as to its neuroprotective effects and things like that. So yes, we, we come in full circles back to where we were. Correct. Correct. But it, I mean, it's interesting yeah. That, uh, because it was Morgan Scow and uh, Alec Coppin, I mean, they took up the cudgels on behalf mm. of lithium mm. that we were able to save lithium. But it was uh, in those days, helioperidol was the drug of choice. In fact, it was a well, the antipsychotic of choice. Yes, yeah, why is sir? You come. Will, will you take the questions, please, Doctor Alim? Uh, sir, your comments, you can you can uh, directly say them. Sir, I don't really have direct comments on the drug that I've never used. But I was very intently listening to your points that you have raised. Considering that most of us here are not as proficient in use of Mao inhibitors, what are the symptoms that we should kind of consider Mao inhibitors as the drug of choice? The results are pretty conflicting, but uh, there's a, a real consensus that if there is a, an over-representation of anxiety, among inhibitors probably work better. You wouldn't use that in retarded depression. At some point in time, it used to be, some point in time, we were told that if there's diurnal worsening in the evenings compared to the classical depression, which should be worse in the morning, you should consider meclobamide as a drug of choice. What do you have to say to that, sir? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm aware of the paper that you are alluding to. That was a paper that came from Ranga Ramakrishnan, yeah. otherwise a very good researcher, a very good researcher that way, and a good friend of mine. But on the other hand, if you look at that, I mean, the patients that he studied, the numbers were very, very small, 10 patients. Uh, well, it's still an open question right now. I wouldn't really go along with that. At this moment in time, we don't really have any evidence, any concrete evidence to perhaps accept that as a, perhaps a gospel truth. So for the students who are listening to this talk, what would be your uh, one point indication for meclobamide? Well, I would certainly be, for instance, if there is preponderance of headache, which is a very common symptom in a depression that way. Somatic symptoms. Somatic symptoms. And especially headache. Macleodomide is very, very good over there. And I personally use that for migraine, in fact. Migraine and secondary depression, I've used that. that. So did any of your patients took an overdose of uh, Mao inhibitors with... Uh intention to harm self or die? Uh, some of them did. Some of them did, but <laughs> probably the same number as my patients on imipravine and amitriptyline did. What was the outcome? Did any of them die or they... No, no, no not really. At least my patients did not die. So is there something like fatal dose nine times the prescribed dose can be fatal dose with tricyclics? Do we have some such equation with Mao inhibitors? But the British National Formulary and the Swedish National Formulary do say that you shouldn't take more than 10 times the prescribed dose. I mean, that is what the Swedish National Formulary says. That was, I mean, that was the last place I had my job. I looked at the Swedish National Formulary. I was a professor in Gothenburg at that time. So there's a nice question from Dr. Agarwal. This is apart from hmm. a cheese reaction, considering the significant interaction with host of psychotropics, and other medications, 
how easy or difficult do you think it will be for a molecule like meclobamide to be regularly prescribed in patients of depression, also considering the large number of uh, TRDs? Well, uh, I personally didn't see any evidence. In many of my patients, I have used antipsychotic drugs, major tranquilizers over there. And if you use them in moderate doses, you don't really see any major reaction, hypotensive crisis, and other things. So I certainly wouldn't have any difficulty. If you look at the reports, now Saul Slider did publish a few papers on that before he retired. That, in fact, that was the last paper he published in Baltimore, Saul Slider, on the potentiating reaction of reversible monoamine oxidase inhibitors. But uh, even there, if we look at that paper, I mean, he didn't really come up with any conclusion. It was pretty much an open question there. That paper appeared in Psychopharmacological, uh, uh, Psychopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacopharmacop
Sir, would you would you suggest uh, complementing your supplementing panthenone with any other antidepressants alongside? No, I personally am very uh, wary about polypharmacy. I'm generally, I'm trying to stick to one antidepressant at a time. The only exception that I did was in the early years when L-tryptophan used to be, I mean, we generally used to potentiate monoamine oxidase inhibitors with L-tryptophan. But L-tryptophan has been off the market for about 40 years now. But my, this, is, this question is particularly about uh, whether we can do the crossover uh, with starting a new antidepressant. Uh, uh, and I must that... add, uh, crossover is very difficult here because you have to wait for at least about three weeks before you cross over to tricyclic so SSRIs. That is something exactly. that you have to remember. Not with amoclitamide because that is reversible. But with exactly. the irreversible, bonamine oxidase inhibitor. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. That, that was my last. Thanks for reminding me there. Crossover is difficult. Yeah. Uh, if the patient is uh, very depressed or continuing to have symptoms and, and the patient is on uh, NAOI, you need to stop the NAOI, wait for the washout period for about four weeks, and then you start a new antidepressant. So the patient really struggles in, in the meantime while waiting for the washout period and you, you start a new medication. That, that's one of the difficulties we face. You do require washout period. You are right that way. But that applies to antidepressant. I mean, if you want to switch over from a, a tricyclics or SSRIs to monoamine oxidase inhibitors, you have you, you require this, a similar washout period. Moclidomide carries an advantage in that regard. If you want yes. to switch over from moclidomide to SSRIs, I mean, there was one particular antidepressant that was introduced way back, I believe, in 1978. Now, that particular antidepressant, I would say, in my experience, turned out to be absolutely useless for depression, but very good for sedation. I'm talking of trazodone. Trazodone is still available right now, but I haven't come across a single clinician who has expressed any satisfaction with the, the antidepressant for, uh, effects of trazodone. I mean, it's very good as a tranquilizer. Uh, of, uh, I wouldn't say tranquilizer, as a hypnotic. But if you look at the efficacy of trazodone, um, trazodone was introduced specifically that uh, because uh, it, uh, the way it was marketed, that uh, if you want to move over from trazodone to tricyclics, you don't need a washout period. But then I personally wouldn't recommend that. I mean, I've used trazodone, but uh, primarily as a hypnotic. And that is the way I would say, I mean, moclidomide, we still need further studies, but on the other hand, theoretically, if you look at from a, from a pharm pharmacological angle, it shouldn't be, I mean, the washout period shouldn't be three to four weeks, as you might expect in the other monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So there's a related question from Dr. Dipayan Sarkar on what is the minimum date of uh, abstinence from SSRIs? before we switch on to trenilcypromine? That, that is exactly what I meant, that, that you have yeah. to wait for a minimum of two weeks. Two weeks. I mean, that, uh, a minimum of two weeks. Clive Tonk published a paper. I think uh, it was uh, in the psychological medicine way back in 2004. A minimum of two weeks, really. A minimum of two weeks, that. But that, that would apply, I mean, if you reverse it, that would apply for the monoamine oxidase inhibitors as well. Dr. Eileen, will you take the questions? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question, sir. Uh, so in relation to that, uh, the washout period, there is another question by Dr. RR. Now, there's no full name for that. Uh, so in our Indo Indian scenario, if we choose to prescribe bowel inhibitors, what foods and uh, comorbidity should we care be careful about? What would we be have advice? to avoid fermented food. We tend to use quite a lot of fermented food, fermented cheese, fermented pickles, achars. Those are the things that we have to avoid. The stored food, the tin food, that is something that we would be very, very wary about. Fresh food, that's okay. And, and, tyramine, and, okay. In preserved food, the amount of tyramine is infinitely greater. Okay, sir. And but on the other hand, as I said, I haven't come across, I mean, even in India, I haven't come across I mean, I have any reports. In fact, I looked at the 
before this particular talk, I looked at the Indian Journal of Psychiatry, in fact. There haven't been, at least in the last five years, I have come across any reports of cheese reaction, at least in the last five years. Okay. Sir, uh, relationship with alcohols, any, any sort of alcohols that should be avoided? All the alcohol should be avoided that way, as much as possible that way, I would say, as, my, as much as possible. But uh, if you take it in moderation, and if you're able to handle that, I suppose, I mean, you could get away with that. But by and large, any antidepressant, tricyclics and SSRIs included, alcohol should be avoided. I mean, that is what I advise my patients. And any comorbidity, Dr. Arara has again mentioned, any comorbid illnesses, conditions? Uh, well, uh, if somebody has, because, I mean, it's metabolized in the liver, monoamine oxidase, in a bit, uh, in a bit, uh, monoamine oxidase is an abundance in the liver. So if you have, I mean, if a patient has liver difficulties, one has to be doubly careful. If there are renal problems, one has to be doubly careful. But that, that is about all specific, specific the illnesses that way. Okay. Uh, any now, if you look at the formulary, you come across at least about 20, 30 effects. But uh, that is something, I mean, they are reporting that, they, they are mentioning that because it has been reported. They haven't actually published the papers. They haven't actually referred the papers that they, they are extrapolating the information from. Uh, any so, sexual any sexual side effects? Yeah, including with moclidomide. But then, then again, I'm not altogether sure if, if the incidence is any higher than perhaps the tricyclics that way. Yeah. So for that matter, the other major tranquilizers, if you look at I mean, uh, Tommy Bonds published a very interesting paper which created a lot of controversy. I think it was in the early 80s. The 97 percent of patients on thyroidazine had major sexual problems. Now, thyroidazine was a very popular <coughs> antipsychotic in those days. If 97 percent of patients with thyroidazine had sexual difficulties, then one had to be careful. And the same applies over here. I mean, you would have the last uh, paper that I remember was published in 2019, where a patient did report sexual difficulty in Acta Psychiatrica Scandinavica. So that was the last paper that I, well, I need to double check that, but the, that was the last paper that expressed concern about the uh, major sexual difficulties with monoamine oxidase and inhibitors. But then, then, then again, uh, you have to do a comparative analysis. Amitriptyline is known for that. Major sexual problems there. Okay. And putting on weight, that's another. Putting on weight is, of course, a major problem. One has to take that into account. Uh, sir, any, any role in uh, impulsivity, aggression, sort of the antisocial behavior spectrum, any role of uh, uh, Mao there? Uh, well, I personally tend to avoid that. I mean, that is something best dealt with on, with on a psycho psychological basis, on a psychotherapeutic basis. But if there are, I mean, if there's any, any evidence of clinical depression, we can prescribe monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but if the primary problem is social, then that is something that we have to perhaps, I mean, as far as possible, we have to withhold prescribing antipsychotics, eh, sorry, antidepressants there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, sir, uh, will it help in neurodegeneration in any way? Uh, uh, it, 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 <laughs> interesting. I mean, that, that is a very, very interesting question. Stuart Checkley published a paper in which, uh, which he did suggest that it had a role there. But it hasn't been replicated so far. Dennis Murphy at the National Institute of Health tried to replicate it. He couldn't. But that was about 20 years ago. Okay. So, sir, uh, what you're saying is this cheese reaction thing is more of a bad press than an uh, actual uh, or what, what people actually find on ground. Well, uh, 
I have no doubt that it has happened. And I, I have no doubt that uh, perhaps one has to exercise a, a little bit of caution there while prescribing. When, when you're prescribing one amine oxidase inhibitors, you have to actually, I mean, it, we, it is incumbent upon us to perhaps share that with our patients and their relatives, that this is something that is happening. But on the other hand, we have to explain it to them. I mean, if you look at the reports of the cheese reaction or a serotonin reaction, I mean, there haven't been any reports. And uh, as I said, FDA has approved at least four monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They are still in the market there in America. Okay. Because bad press, you're right. You're right, it's, it is bad press. And bad press can lead to a lot of bad things, really. But, but on the other hand, people are very wary. I mean, the... the uh, Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, one has to remember, were very popular at the time when Willie McBride published a simple letter on the effects of, uh, well, Focomelia, if you look at it, Halidomide disaster. He published a single letter in the Lancet, and that created a furor all over the world. So people were very, very careful. They were observing all the reports that came their way, in fact. And that turned out to be a justified alarm because focal media was being overlooked because of the drug promotion activities. Focal media was being overlooked. Now, of course, I, there has been some effort lately to revive thalidomide, but I don't think it's going to go very far. It's received too bad a press, really, for anybody to take it seriously. Sir, so what are the antidepressant effects of salicylene? Because in Parkinson's, <laughs> The neurologist often use it. Well, it, 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 Gerald Stern has published a very nice paper on that. But in America, selicinine is not taken orally, it's taken transdermally. Most of the if we can use it over here, I mean, that, that is a very good study by Mike Pear and Gerald Stern that it does help because selicinine is a selective monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. And monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. Uh, uh, monoamine oxidase B is present in abundance in brain. So that is something that we have to bear in mind that it can be helpful. But on the other hand, well, it is used as primarily used in Parkinsonism, but it does have antidepressant potential. I personally have never used it. Malibus, uh, Resolect uh, and Selegiline, any experience in this? Uh, uh, no, uh, basically uh, it is, uh, as Sir said, uh, it is a, a selective Mao B inhibitor. So it it doesn't uh, kind of uh, have an effect of effect on the metabolism of all monoamines. It is only probably dopamine and norepinephrine, if I'm not mistaken. It doesn't touch serotonin. Whereas uh, Mao A inhibitors, this reversible Mao A inhibitors that we had talked about, they are across the board. Means all the three monoamines, classic monoamines. Uh, their metabolism is inhibited. So why neurologists use this? Because it tends to be a little bit more dopamine specific. That, I mean, Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder, <laughs> specifically dopaminergic in nature. That is what we have known. So that is where it works both ways. So that is that is what my understanding is. Okay. We can try actually, it's available. So, I mean, uh, compared to the uh, the US where they have the transdermal patches and all, we can give it a shot. But the thing is that uh, when we are using it exclusively for depression, in which uh, the, uh, uh, th there, is no, there is no specific dopaminergic neurodegenerative process and that blocks the uh, metabolism or degradation of dopamine, and we, if we have an excess of dopamine function, then there might be some other issues that might crop up. So that we need to be a little bit careful. But well, we can take a leaf from what the neurologists do and use it. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I'd just like to add something. It was in the mid '80s that the dopaminergic antidepressant was used. It was introduced in the market, and it became very popular for a while. It's been taken off the market right now. I'm talking about nomifensin. Nomifensin. Nomifensin was very popular in those days. But, but, but we do have uh, molecules which are specifically uh, dopaminergic. I mean, they increase the dopaminergic, uh, dopaminergic function 
uh, which we use, uh, at least in the resistant types of depression, we use pramipexol. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we also use um, a bupropion, which is, I mean, no, uh, norepinephrinergic and dopaminergic, but they do increase. Mm -hmm. So if you're using that, then selegiline should not be a problem. Now, I don't think side effect profile of salicylin is the problem. Hmm. It's its efficacy that hmm. has been questioned in depression, yeah. not the side effect profile. Salicylin is relatively safe in Parkinsonism. Yeah. Yes. Burke Maya introduced salicylin primarily as an anti Parkinsonian drug. Hmm. But in the paper that he published, Burke Maya, he pointed out that it might be very good for depression. Okay. Uh, sir, Abhinav has asked, uh, any role of moclobamide in social phobia? Yeah, I mean, it, it does have a role. Now, <laughs> I think uh, there is a German study that has, uh, I, let me, I mean, I'm trying to recall that. It was published, uh, I think, uh, in ACTA, but I'd have to double check that. It pointed out that it was uh, very, very useful. It was much better than the other SSRIs and social phobia. But uh, that was the only big study, 35 patients. Okay. Okay. In fact, in fact, uh, uh, when I was a resident, that is the late 90s and, and the addition of uh, Kaplan and Sedoc CTP that was uh, that we were using at that time clearly mentioned that for social anxiety disorder, I mean, what we now know as social anxiety, the name that time was social phobia. Uh, uh, Mao inhibitors are a treatment of choice. That is exactly what I mentioned, yeah. in fact, in my no, introduction. No, that. no, no SSRI, uh, Mao inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So, sir, finally, uh, I think we have covered all the queries that were posted. Uh, how uh, how is it position? How should we position Mao inhibitors in our current spectrum of antidepressants? Efficacy, safety, precautions. So, what is the position of them? Well, there is enough literature to suggest that is efficacious, not in all depressions, but in certain types of depression. I mean, we are not that at that stage to perhaps identify it through cluster analysis, as Eugene Pakel used to say. I mean, if you cluster analysis of depression symptoms, which are going to respond to one particular antidepressant, cluster analysis, and another set of symptoms that are going to respond to another set of uh, anti, another antidepressant. We are not at that stage. For social anxiety, as Dr. Dave has mentioned, certainly monoamine oxidase inhibitors would be my drug of choice. If they are available, if they are not available, then like in my own fossil town, they are not easily available. So I have to go in for SSRIs. But I, I personally have the belief that bone amine oxidase and it but bitters are better. Okay, in terms of safety, okay, well, it has had a bad press. But on the other hand, we have to learn to examine the evidence for that press. I mean, the, there was one particular antidepressant which was introduced in the mid 70s, I recall, which became very popular. And one particular paper led to its removal from the market. I'm talking of Mianserin. Mianserin is no longer available nowadays in India. I may be mistaken, but it's no longer available. No, it's not but if you look at the literature, that I mean, it, it, the reasons why it was withdrawn from the market is pretty flimsy evidence. So, okay. One has to exercise caution, but on the other hand, one doesn't have to get hysterical about that. In fact, I mean, one has to take that into account that, okay, there are side effects, but there are side effects with practically every antidepressant. Is it any worse? I, my answer would be a categorical negative. So that certainly would be there. I mean, there's certainly something very useful at the Going back on that, I mean, there was a time I went through that stage when ECT was regarded in the same way that way. I mean, ECT received a very bad press. Now, I have to keep, well, I belong to that generation that had to convince the population from time to time that ECT was safer than tooth extraction. At least in Europe, it was safer than tooth extraction that way. People don't usually, 
Then again, a brilliant paper by Weeks, Freeman, and Kendall came along, and that dispelled many of the doubts there, for that matter. So we use ECT, I mean, we don't use that indiscriminately, but we use ECT as a remarkably effective treatment. And the, while stupor is not that common in uh, the Western countries, I believe that stupor, uh, stuporose patients are pretty common, stuporose and catatonic patients are pretty common in India. What else are you going to do with a patient with stupor except use the ECT? I mean, you, that is the only thing that you can do over there. But uh, I recall that time in the mid 70s, early 80s, an ECT was re receiving such a bad press. And there were some very, very ill informed politicians who were making an issue out of it. ECT is still, I mean, in about 22 of the 50 states in America, ECT is still a taboo. And then again, you had that the Basalia in Italy, who came up with that loony idea that ECT was tantamount to torture. For about 30 years, ECT was not used in Italy. You could see what happened in Italy after that. Patients <laughs> were walking on the street, really. Stuporose patients were walking on the streets. So one has to avoid that. One has to take that into context. Politicians don't understand psychopharmacology. At least, I mean, we shouldn't take their word. Politicians, I mean, they have their political constituency to nurture, but they're, I mean, they're, they're, the amount of psychopharmacology that, that they know, or the extent of psychopharmacological expertise that they have, you can write in the back of a poster stamp. So what is the dose that you recommend? Starting dose and maximum dose as monotherapy? Uh, well, phenylcine, I've gone up to 60. At times, I've gone up to 75. Phenylcine. Um, Meclobamide? Meclobamide? Huh? Meclobamide, I have gone up to 400. At times, I've gone more than 400, in fact. But I usually start with 300 in any case. Okay. And, and tranin saprobum, sir? Tranylcypramine, I have never gone beyond 60. Oh. And 60 was, a, well, that was a rash. I mean, I had to perhaps use that. I mean, that, that wasn't something that I'm terribly comfortable with, but I had to use that over there at that time. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go up to 60. Okay. 50, okay. I've used that, and a couple of patients. 40 is something that I generally place a limit on. Many clinicians tend to combine benzodiazepines with antidepressants. What about benzodiazepines with Mao inhibitors? Very easily. You can uh, prescribe that. I mean, there, there are no potentiating reactions there. And it certainly really doesn't, doesn't diminish the efficacy of benzodiazepines. Does tenosapramine, uh, does meclobamide uh, affect the memory? in long use, long-term use? There has been one paper that suggested that it does. But uh, when I looked at the paper, it was a study on seven patients. So that is an open question right now. But what age? Patient's age? Uh, uh, well, you never, uh, as I said, I have never used, and uh, right at the moment, we don't have any evidence, any say, <laughs> justifiable evidence of using uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors in patients under 18. So you only use that in the adults, really. And maximum age in older age, in geriatric age group? Geriatric age, age group, I have used phenylzine. As I said, I have used phenylzine in pretty high doses, in fact. And some of them I inherited, they were already on phenylzine. Many of the patients at that time I inherited from other consultants, they were already on phenylzine, and I continued with that. Any effects on prolactin and menstrual uh, cycles? No, uh, well, uh, not really. Not, uh, not uh, that I'm convinced about. In safety. fact, because many of my patients... Safety. Mm, pregnancy, uh, pregnancy you should, it should be avoided. Pregnancy it should be avoided, yeah. Because we don't have enough data. And lactating also. Lactating mothers also... And lactating, yeah. Well, lactate, but in lactating, you have to avoid most of the other antidepressants as well. I mean, there was a paper from Australia which was discredited later, which suggested that the uh, tricyclists could be administered to lactating mothers 
but that paper was comprehensively discredited later on. Okay. Okay, sir, I think uh, we have covered almost all the aspects. So any uh, final comments from the chairpersons, then we go to Dr. Tufan Pati, sir. I think Dr. Mahal, I would uh, summarize the presentation and the discussion. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it has been a very uh, enlightening discussion on a drug that uh, uh, we were fortunate to kind of revisit after many years. Uh, a nice perspective on how to uh, look at it in terms of how do we match with uh, the kind of patients that we are uh, looking at, uh, how to use it, what are the effects, side effects of the whole gamut of uh, uh, things that uh, we look uh, in a drug before we uh, consider using it. And of course, uh, this, this lecture should, uh, for one, the most important thing, should go a long way in dispelling the myth that... Uh, there is something called as a cheese reaction, first of all. And secondly, that the cheese reaction is a problematic thing. And the third thing is that the cheese reaction or the scare of the cheese reaction should kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of discourage uh, us to use the molecule. Uh, we addressed everything and uh, we had a very interesting and an enlight enlightening discussion. Uh, so from uh, my side and from on behalf of Dr. Vaiya, we would like to thank... Uh, uh, Dr. Aleem, Dr. Tofan Pati and the team of Thursday Musings for inviting us here uh, uh, to be a part of this uh, audience to uh, listen to Dr. Prasad and his uh, expertise uh, with Mawa Inhibitors. Thank you so much and over to you, Ali. Thank you, sir. Tofan, sir, your comments and thanks also. Word of thanks. Thank you, Aleem. First of all, let me convey sincere gratitude to Dr. Prasad, for this nice enlightening lecture and first the using team feels quite happy and obliged that he is with us as a faculty. Thank you, sir. So my career as a psychiatrist starts from the beginning of 1980s, just 1980s. Um, we have never used Mao inhibitors to a great extent. I have tried some time. Honestly, we have not also come across reports of any serious adverse effects in Indian journals. But the only question remains, if it is still available here, what hindered the psychiatrists from not writing manoyama? It is not my response, but the overall response from all the psychiatrists all over India. Even if it was not having remarkable side effects and even all other uh, antidepressants had some serious side effects. It could not pick up in a... For me, it was because lack of adequate response. And when it was responding properly, maybe after some time, one become very about the cheese reaction, even if it has not happened. But it did not pick up without any bias because it was being marketed with all pharmacological forms that we find for all the So, but the lecture by Dr. So. Prashad inspires us to retry it and be a little more safer with it. Thank you. But this is astounding. It did not have any, we don't have reports. Still, we didn't write it. We stopped writing it. You see the market sell. During the seminar, I was trying to see the market sell. It's quite low. So, because in general, as a body, we did not accept it from all the time it has come. That is all. And thank you very much for this enlightening speech. And this will be available on uh, YouTube. Many of my co-organizers, friendships have already requested me that share the Facebook link. We'll share the link with them. Because in the other room, the serious meeting is going on about friendships. But I am here. So we have to thank the chair. Yeah. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank first of all the... Sir, before we uh, thank the chair, I want the speaker to know what one of the participants has to say about the meeting today. Dr. Venu Sharma writes that it is really impressive to see someone recollect journal articles the way Dr. Prasad has in today's session. It speaks volumes about his depth of knowledge and experience. Truly a wonderful 
and enriching session. I think that virtually sums up the feeling of most of the uh, participants today. <laughs> That's really kind. Thank you so much. Indeed. And behalf of Thursday Museums, our sincere gratitude to Chairperson Dr. B. M. Baya and Dr. Malay Dabe for nicely conducting the session and quite naturally giving the rich inputs. Mm -hmm. And I am also thankful to Dr. Alim Siddiqui getting in alone in the absence of Dr. Amit Patujasi for this session. And thanks to the whole mm -hmm. Thursday Museum team whom you don't see. And thanks to current pharmaceutical. And last but not least, this is on behalf of IPS Research and Friends. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you, everyone. A really wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me over here. Thank you so much. Will mm. I invite you again, sir, if you don't mind? <laughs> Anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. <laughs> okay. There will be. Are you coming to Ansif, sir? Brother? Ansif Sorry? Ansif 2023 to be in Bhubaneswar. I can scan the registration list, but I don't. Are you coming to Bhubaneswar, Ansif? Achha. When is it, in fact? I wasn't aware of that. When is it? Oh, oh sorry, it is too late. It is 2nd to 5th February in Bhubaneswar. Oh, it would be it would be a little bit difficult that way. It certainly but would be. But I certainly would 